Redeemer. Your priceless blood has ransomed us. It was our sin that drove the bitter nails through your hands and through your feet and drove the bitter spear into your side and drove the bitter crown of thorns atop your head and whipped the bitter whip that tore the flesh off of your back. It was all our sin, God, and more than any of that, that you hung on the cross and bore the full weight of your Father's wrath against our sin that we might be the redeemed and that you might be our redeemer. And so we glory in you and we glorify you and we give you praise and we worship you as our king and as our God, as our savior, as our high priest and as our sacrifice. Um, You are worthy of our praise and our glory. And I pray that your name would be exalted this night and that your story would continue to unfold before our eyes from the inerrant, infallible, sufficient, inspired word of God. We thank you for all the good that you've done in our lives, and may we worship you and serve you as we ought. In your precious, precious name we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and have a seat. It's good to have everyone back. Uh, We're going to continue our study in 2 Samuel tonight, so if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to 2 Samuel, we're going to be in chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6. So we'll be looking in 2 Samuel chapter 6, but first I want to just tell you a little story from church history. So it was the year 144 AD, and an important and well-known individual in the church made a shocking claim. Uh, Marcion of Sinope, uh, he was the son of a bishop, born in, in the latter end of the first century AD, and he lived into the majority of the second century AD, really the, the, the first generation after the apostles had passed away. And this, this young man, Marcion, he grew up in the church. He grew up in the, the Eastern Orthodox Church in, in Asia Minor. And around the age of 50, he traveled to Rome, and he became a member of the Roman Church. And he, he grew in acclaim, and he was a, a leader in the church. But while he was there in Rome, over the course of several years and over the, the course of much study, Marcion would develop a warped theology and a distorted view of God. And then in the year 144, he made his shocking claim. You see, as he studied the scripture, he became convinced that there could not be just one God. Uh, He saw clearly in the Old Testament a God full of wrath, a God who flooded the earth, a God who rained fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He saw a God who slayed all the firstborn of Egypt, who swallowed the followers of Korah into the earth, who sent fiery serpents into the camp of the Israelites. He saw this wrathful, angry, vindictive, vengeful God. One author writes about Marcion that in the God of the Old Testament, he saw a being whose character was stern justice and therefore anger, contentiousness and unmercifulness. The law which rules nature and man appeared to him to accord with the characteristics of this God and the kind of law revealed by him. And therefore it seemed credible to him that this God is the creator and Lord of the world. And as the law which governs the world is inflexible and yet, on the other hand, full of contradictions, just and again brutal, and as the law of the Old Testament exhibits what he saw as the same features, so the God of creation was to Marcion a being who united in himself the whole gradations of justice, malevolence, obstinacy, and inconsistency. Marcion was terrified by that God. But in the New Testament, he saw what appeared to be a different God, a God of a different sort. He saw a God of grace and love, a God who had sent his own son to die for sinners, a God who promised blessing and not cursing, a God who called for turning the other cheek. And Marcion, he could not reconcile the two. He could not fathom that these two were one and the same, that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament was one God. And so he concluded that there must be two gods, 
Uh, one good and one evil. One full of kindness and compassion, the other full of wrath and vengeance. And these teachings rattled the early church, and eventually they were condemned as heresy. And it spurred the early church on to, to unite and, and set the canon of Scripture so that they knew exactly what they believed and what the Bible taught about God. And really this argument that Marcin had about this vindictive, wrathful, vengeful God of the Old Testament is not new to us. This isn't a foreign argument. This is something that we hear all the time. Uh, author and speaker Richard Dawkins, who is a staunch atheist and um, someone who would describe himself as anti-religious, he says the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now I imagine that you've heard from a friend or a coworker or a classmate or an acquaintance, you've heard this objection that the God that is portrayed in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is wrathful, hateful, vindictive, surely not a good God. And so the question is, how do we as believers and as Christians who accept the entire word of God as true, how do we respond? How do we answer this objection? Well, in our chapter this morning, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we are confronted by what Paul in Romans 11 calls the kindness and severity of God. And I think by understanding this chapter, we'll be better equipped to reconcile these two sides of God. And it's not just to answer this objection when it comes to us or when it is asked of us, but I think it's helpful for us to answer the question when it runs through our own minds. And when we read the Old Testament and we see what God does in his activity, and it doesn't always make sense to us, understanding that God is both kind and severe will help us as we read Scripture and will actually give us a greater love and greater adoration and a greater reverence for the God of the Bible, the one true living God. And so we come to chapter 6. Uh, and I see in this chapter three movements or three separate sections, and it's just a way to break down this chapter and take it into sizable chunks. The first section I see is in verses 1 through 11, and we'll call this section a king to be feared. A king to be feared. So go ahead and read with me, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. In verse 1, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Bel Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Peretz Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So let's just back up and remind ourselves of where we're at in the story of 2 Samuel. David, as we saw last week in chapter 5, he is officially king. He has everything he needs to be king. He's the right man for the job. He has national unity. The people of Israel have come around him and they have supported him and, and they have submitted to his rulership and his shepherdship over them. He has military strength. He has conquered the Philistines. He had conquered Saul. 
He has no more enemies. And he has the all-important city of Jerusalem as his capital. This historic city is now the military and political center of the nation. And David, he has everything he needs to officially, firmly establish his throne. The problem is for a people, the nation of Israel, people that are meant to be consecrated unto the Lord, to serve the Lord, and to be a witness and a light to the nations, just having political and military unity and centrality, it's not enough. They also need religious unity. And David, a man after God's own heart, he understands this, and he wants Jerusalem, his city, his capital, the city of David, to be the center of religion in Jerusalem. And so to accomplish this, he will bring Israel's most sacred object there. And so here in verse 2, he has gathered what we're told is all the chosen men of Israel to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem. And we can see in this text just how monumental this event is. David brings a literal army, 30,000 men, into a city that would have only been a couple acres large. He brings an army to escort this ark, this wooden box, only 10 miles from Baal Judah to Jerusalem. And in verse 5, we see that David and all the people of Israel, they are celebrating before the Lord. They are singing, they are dancing, they are playing music with instruments. Uh, This is a celebration, it's a joyous event, it's a nationwide party. And the question is why? Why all the celebration? Why all the excitement over this centuries-old box of wood? And for us, being several thousand years removed from this event, we have to go back and try and understand the significance of the Ark of the Lord in the mind of these Israelites. So real quick, I want you to flip backwards in your Bible to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, so you're going to be flipping left in your Bible almost all the way to the beginning, to the second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 25. And beginning in verse 10, we see God's instructions for building this ark. He says, They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay with pure gold inside and outside. You shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it, and you shall put into the ark of the testimony that I give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat seat, shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. The faces one to the other toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. We see in this passage in verse 16 that this Ark of the Covenant, it contained God's testimony to Israel. In verse 17 to 21, as it describes the construction of the mercy seat, we see that God says when this mercy seat is complete, when it has been placed on the Ark, that is the place where God will come and meet His people. You see, the Ark, it was a representation. It represented the presence of God. It is where God chose to reside among his people. The Ark of the Covenant would have been in the most holy of holies, in the holiest place in all the camp of Israel, in the center of the tabernacle where no person could go. It was there that God met with them. It was there that God spoke to them, where he gave them his revelation. And we even see in 2 Samuel the, the, the emphasis placed on this Ark. It's called the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. 
In Numbers chapter 10, as Moses and the Israelites are marching through the desert, it says, And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when the ark rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousands of Israel. And you see, the ark, it's so closely associated with the presence of God that when the ark would set out and it would lead out in front of the people of Israel as they marched, to them it was the same as saying, Arise, O Lord, and lead us. And when the ark came to rest in a spot, it was, O Lord, take rest. Even David himself, he calls the ark the footstool of our God. This ark was associated with God's, his kingship, his rulership. It was his throne where he sat enthroned among his people. It was a place where atonement for sins was made on the Day of Atonement. It represented God's reconciliation with His people. The one place where they could go to be made right with God. It was where He spoke to them, Exodus 25 tells us. And inside the ark there were the Ten Commandments, the revelation, the written revelation of God given to the nation. It represented His revelation to them. And so in bringing the ark to Jerusalem, David is saying that God's presence... The very presence of God, it cannot stay on the outskirts of Jerusalem, on the outskirts of Israel anymore. It must be brought to the center. It must be central to everything that Israel is and does. You see, David understood that worship of God had to be at the heart of Israel's life as a nation. Worship of God had to be central and center and emphasized before anything else if this people was to be holy and set apart. And the true is same for us. Worship must be central in our lives and at the center of our heart. And the question is, is it? Is worship of God at the heart of your life? It's a simple question, and the temptation is to say, yes, of course, God is more important to me. But I look at my life, and I see that it is not always the case. It's easy to get distracted with school or work or family or relationships or a myriad of other things. And it is so easy to put God and the worship of God on the back burner. How many days do you wake up and find it such a struggle just to read your Bible, just to spend time in prayer with God? How many Fridays and Sundays do you spend as everyone else around you sings and your mind is off in another place thinking about something else that at that moment in time is more important to you? You, We were made... And we were created by God to worship God, to bear his image, to bring him glory. That must be at the heart of our lives. And you must ask yourself if it is or if it is not. We were made for worship. We were made to glorify God. Do we do that as a people? So we come back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Go ahead and flip back there. It's not long before this joyous occasion, this nationwide party, this celebration turns to disaster. In verse 6, we see that the oxen that are pulling the ark, they stumble. And Uzzah, he reaches out just to keep the ark from falling, and he touches it. And in verse 7, it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down. Now, as you read that, doesn't that just offend you a little bit? Aren't you left asking why? Why does God do this? I mean, poor Uzzah is just trying to help. He's trying to catch the ark, this sacred object, from falling on the ground. Why does God do this? You see, when I read this passage, my first inclination is to say, that seems so unfair and just very unnecessary to strike the man dead for trying to help. It's passages like these that cause people to see God as vengeful and wrathful and vindictive and inconsistent. But before we pronounce God, on God, judgment, we need to understand this scene. See, in this scene, we see the severity of God. It seems that the intentions of David are good. He wants God, he wants the presence of God to be central in the nation's heart and thought. But the reality is, as we closely examine the text, that there is a hint of pride here as well. In chapter 5, before gathering the men of Israel and going to battle against the Philistines, what does David always do? Do you guys remember? What does David do before he goes to battle? 
He inquires of the Lord. But we don't see that in this chapter. You see, David, he jumped the gun without the Lord's guidance. David is lacking in patience. He's calling his own shots. See, David knows that the presence of God in Jerusalem will give his kingship divine validation. And David wants this. He needs this. The problem is he wants it now. And it seems that for a moment, David has forgotten his place. He has forgotten who the true king is. And marring this joyous scene is an undercurrent of impatience and irreverence for God. If we were to flip back to Numbers 4, and you don't have to go there, but if we were to go to Numbers chapter 4, God gives clear, specific instructions for how to transport the Ark of the Covenant and all the holy things that were housed in the tabernacle. And in chapter 4, in verse 15, God gives these instructions, and he says, And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out, After that, the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. These are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Kohath are to carry. See, how was the ark supposed to be transported? It was meant to be carried on poles. Those are the instructions God gave. It was not to be placed on a cart. Furthermore, it was not to be touched or even looked upon by anyone else except the Aaronic priests. But none of this attention to detail is given in 2 Samuel 6, is it? No, the ark is transported on a cart because a cart is quicker, it's expedient. It's the fastest way for David to transport the ark from Baal Judah to Jerusalem. He's impatient, he doesn't want to wait And the problem is David and Uzzah and the entire nation of Israel, they should have known this. They had the scriptures. They had Numbers chapter 4. But David is in a hurry. He's in a hurry. You see, this scene, this isn't a scene of worship of God. This is a scene of disobedience. And Uzzah suffers for it. He suffers for this disobedience. You see, that, that is the severity of God. His holiness is lethal. The text says that he breaks out against Uzzah. It's the same language that that was used to describe God breaking out against the Philistines in chapter 5. But here, it's an Israelite. It's one of God's people that he breaks out. And it's a reminder to us that God's holiness is just as lethal to us as it is to any non-believer. You see, he is a holy, holy, holy God. He is not our warm, fuzzy friend in heaven. He is a God worthy of our reverence. And there is an appropriate fear of God. He is omnipotent. He is sovereign. He holds the world in our lives in his hands. Jeremiah says that the word of God is like fire. And like a hammer that breaks rocks. That is the word of God. And his word is to be revered and obeyed. And the consequences for disobedience are great. David forgot his place before the king, a king to be feared. And he remembers in verse 9, it says, David was afraid. So afraid that he will not take the ark with him to Jerusalem anymore. That one thing he desired so much that he was willing to act in an irreverent way to make it happen. He is far too terrified to do it. And I wonder as we read this passage, if we are ever struck by a fear of God's holiness. Do we fear to disobey God? Or is it that when we sin and when we disobey God, we don't even give Him a second thought? Do we understand the holiness and perfection of God and the danger that it is to us as unholy creatures when we are disobedient, irreverent, when we sin God's holiness is lethal, and it will be lethal against you if you're not in Christ. And that's what we see. We see God's severity, his intolerance for sin, his intolerance for disobedience. It's the severity of God. But as we come to verse 12, it's in this chapter that this whole, it's in this verse that this whole chapter hinges. And we see that that same God who just showed his severity 
is also a king to be celebrated. And that's the second movement in this chapter in verses 12 to 19, a king to be celebrated. We see that the Lord, and let's go ahead and read it together, beginning in verse 12. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. See, we see in verse 12, David hears this news that that. God has blessed the household of Obed-Edom, and it is music to David's ears. And so he reorganizes, and he prepares to bring the Ark of the Lord to Jerusalem again. But this scene is entirely different from the first scene. In verse 13, it says that those who bore the Ark, indicating what? This time the Ark is carried on poles, as God intended and gave instructions to do. You see, David, he is no longer in a hurry, is he? Every six six steps, he stops the procession and he offers a sacrifice to the Lord. He's taking his time. He's being methodical. He's being careful. He's being reverent, making sure that everything he does glorifies God. And this act, with, with the six steps echoing the six days of creation and that seventh step being the moment of rest, God, David is showing that he rightly understands his place before the Creator. David has remembered his place. He is a king in service of the one true king. And notice the outcome of this scene. It is joyous. It is a joyous scene. In verse 14, David is dancing before the Lord with all his might. In verse 15, the people are singing and they are shouting to the Lord. In verse 18, sacrifices are being offered and blessings are being made over all the people. Everything about the scene is joy and worship and celebration. And it all began with obedience. And that's the lesson for us is that joy, that unbridled, overflowing joy, it begins with obedience. You see, we are rejoicing in the Lord when we are obeying him when we are submitting to his will for our lives, when we walk in accord with his commandments, when we obey his statutes, when we love his law, that is when we are most blessed, that is when we are most joyful. The reality is, there is no joy in rebellion. There is no joy in disobedience. Joy begins with obedience, with submission to the king. And David understands this now. And in verse 19, all the people of Israel leave this event blessed with food in their hands and joy in their hearts. And see, this, in this scene, this is the kindness of, of God. He is a God to be celebrated, a God to be enjoyed, a God to be worshipped. Psalm 1611 tells us that in your presence there is what? Fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, the same God that is burning hot with holiness is brimming over with unbridled joy and blessing for those who obey him. And for us, if we would only submit to God, to his law, to his will, we would experience that fullness of joy that is only found in a life lived in service to the king. Now there is something else to notice here in David's life. In this scene we see David David wearing what? 
a linen ephod. And he's offering sacrifices before the Lord, and he is blessing the people of God. Now, who is he acting like? What does all this activity remind you of? He's acting like a priest. You see, the linen ephod, that's what priests wore. 1 Samuel 2 and 22 tell us that. And to bless the people of God, that was a priestly function, something reserved for priests. You see, this chapter, it's portraying David as a king priest. A king priest in the order of Melchizedek, his forerunner as king of Jerusalem, and a king priest as a shadow of the ultimate king priest, Jesus Christ. And this is the only time that David will be portrayed this way, because this is as close as David will ever come to being the king priest that Israel's king was supposed to be. When David submits to the Lord, his king, he comes closest to being a true king. But alternatively, when he goes his own way, when he's calling the shots, he is as far from being a king as he can possibly be. And I wonder if we understand that reality in our lives. Do we understand that as the people of God, we are called to be holy, to be set apart unto the Lord, and this means obedience? 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so the question I have to ask you is, how much do you value holiness in your life? And do you realize that holiness is an outcome of your obedience? That as you conform to God's standard and as you you become more like Christ, as you behold Him and as you obey His will for your life, you become closer and closer to what God intended you to be. We are never more like Christ than when we are obedient. And we are never further from Christ than when we are rebellious and disobedient. See, holiness is the issue here. It's a lesson that David learned as he learned to fear the Lord and then celebrate the Lord. And the greater obedience, the greater our obedience to God and his word, the greater joy we find in the presence of God. And the closer we come, we come to being what God intended us to be as a people of God, set apart, holy, a light to the rest of the world around us. David was as close as he would ever come to being the king that he was meant to be when he was obedient. And that thought, it carries over into the final movement of this chapter. In verses 20 to 23, we'll see a king to be served. So reading in verse 20, the text tells us, And David returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel honored himself today. Uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And this chapter closes by saying that Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. And so this chapter, it closes on a somewhat somber note. Michael, David's wife, she does not share the joy of the nation of Israel. She is disgusted at what she sees. She is mortified at the the display of David's unbridled joy and enthusiasm. She accuses David of humiliating himself before the servant woman. And she says it's unbecoming of a king to act such a way. We don't, maybe she didn't like this humble David. Maybe she preferred the warrior David, the one who acquired 200 Philistine foreskins to win her hand. She does not like this new humility she sees. But see, David, he understands that this king, his king, is a king to be served. 
And so his response is, it was before the Lord that he danced. And he says that he will become even more contemptible, even more abased in the eyes of man, if it means rejoicing and serving in his king. And I want you to listen carefully to this sentence. A proper reverence or fear of the Lord, balanced by a proper joy in the Lord, will produce a proper service to the Lord. Did you catch that? A proper reverence or fear of the Lord, balanced by a proper joy in the Lord, will produce a proper service to the Lord. That's why in this chapter, David is as close as he will ever be to being the king priest that Israel's king was supposed to be. And in contrast, Michael does not fear God. She does not celebrate God. She has no joy in him, and she is struck barren. Something that would have been seen as a curse, I guess, or a curse brought on by God. And the author, the author reminds us that this Michael, she is the daughter of Saul. He says it three times. He repeats it for us so that we don't forget that her barrenness means the end of the Saulite house. And the rise of David's house. There will be no heir to come from her. You see, this is the kindness and severity of God. God is a holy God to be feared, and he is also a God full of blessing to be rejoiced and served. And these things, they go together. You cannot separate them. You see, it is only with a proper fear of God that we can properly rejoice in God and in his forgiveness, and only then can we properly serve God as he deserves to be served, as our king, as our lord, as our sovereign, as our master. But as we come to the end of this chapter, we have to be reminded that like Uzzah and Michael and even David, we fall short. We fall short of God's holiness. Our nature, our very being is pervaded by sin, tainted by unholiness. And if we honestly evaluate our lives, how could we ever have any posture other than fear and trembling before a holy, living God? As we see the severity of God in this chapter, God who leaves no room for error, not a single inch for disobedience, how can we possibly stand before him? What hope does a sinner have before a God like this? How do we achieve that joy? How can we celebrate in a God who stands over us with a word like fire and like a hammer ready to break us to pieces for our disobedience to him? And for that answer, how we can stand before God and live, we return to the ark. We said that the ark, it represents God's rulership. It represents his reconciliation and it represents his revelation. And what you must realize is that in Christ, all three of those things are fulfilled. Everything that the ark was meant to represent finds its perfect fulfillment in Christ. You see, Christ, he carries out the offices of prophet, priest, and king. Hebrews 1 tells us that Christ is the perfect, full, and final revelation from God. It's the revelation of God. He is the revelation of God. He is our great high priest. He made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. And even to this day, even to this moment, he intercedes on our behalf before the Father. It's the reconciliation of God found only in Christ. And finally, he is our king seated at the right hand of God, to whom has been given all authority and all dominion under heaven and earth. It's the rulership of God, all of these things, everything that the ark symbolized, this box of wood that the people of Israel rejoiced over and sang over and feared and trembled before, all of that is fulfilled and culminates in Christ. And because he is our prophet and our priest and our king, we can experience that fullness of joy in the Lord's presence. Because when you turn to Christ and you recognize that he is your only hope, that he has paid the price for those very sins that separate you from a holy God, that when you stand before God the judge, Christ, if you know him, clothes you in his righteousness, even as he takes off your tainted, dirty robes of unholiness, then you can understand how the severity of God and the kindness of God, they coalesce and collide in the person of Christ because it was on his cross that wrath And grace met. And forgiveness was purchased for all who believe in him. 
the kindness and severity of God are real. But because of Christ, we can rejoice and celebrate at the goodness of God because he has suffered that severity for us so that we might be blessed by that kindness of God. And for those who are in Christ, there is no more condemnation. There is no more judgment. There is no more severity from this burning, hot, holy God. There is only forgiveness. And the question is, as you leave this place, will you partake? Will you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your prophet, your priest, your savior, your sacrifice, your king? Will you rest in him, in him alone, and in his presence find fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for hard texts like 2 Samuel chapter 6. We thank you because you are not a God who lies or deceives. You have told us exactly who you are. You have laid open the eternal consequences of sin. You have made them clear before our eyes. There is no question what it will cost us if we continue to persist in our rebellion and our disobedience. And so we thank you for 2 Samuel chapter 6 where we can see your severity, but we can also see your immense kindness. And we thank you for your son, our prophet and priest and king, the one who fulfilled every office necessary, the one who did everything necessary so that we might know you as father and not as judge. We thank you for Christ the fulfillment of every promise. The second David who went to the cross and bore our shame and our sin that we might be made free and forgiven. And so Father, as we close this evening, I pray that we would worship Christ all the more as we meditate on the judgment and wrath of a holy God and we are reminded that we have been spared so much because Christ took on so much for us. It is in, in his precious name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this final song.